We're going to do a new series while we're here in Luperon. We're going to tell stories because that's a lot of what we do. We sit around with our friends and we tell stories. Mom's going to tell stories and Hannah's going to tell stories. I'm going to tell stories. We're going to try and get some other boaters to tell stories as well. The story we're going to start with is about our first boat six years ago, 27 years ago. And we had a boat that was a 39-foot uh, Yorktown. Uh, deep keel boat, seven foot keel. Uh, looked a lot like a Morgan from the 1970s. She was a good boat, but we got her for a song. I think we paid $25,000 for the boat and we put about $30,000 fixing it up. Uh, it was in dire need of repair, let me tell you. We didn't know anything about sailing. And so one of the things that happened to us in our inexperience, we came through the Bahamas and we went to the outside. We were on our way to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. We didn't have uh, GPS. We had paper charts and an old sextant. The boat was not really set for long distance cruising. Well, at the time, there was a lot less things that relied on electricity so much. That's true. So sure, you might have needed more fuel. That <clears throat> is a given. You right. might, you probably could have used more water, but electricity is not something as necessary as it was, as it is today. Correct. And so everything was manual. We didn't have an autopilot. We didn't have self-steering and we didn't want to go through the exumas because we had a seven foot draft with paper charts so we went straight through the bahamas and over to san salvador and we spent the night in san salvador and we left in the morning and we started trying to take what's called the thorny path and the winds were just not cooperating and so as we tried to work our way southeast we finally gave up and we said we're just going to have to go straight out into the Atlantic. And so that's what we did. We headed due east from San Salvador, right into the middle of the Bermuda Triangle in February. And it seemed like the storms were chasing us. There was one storm after another after another and the waves were big and there were times also that we were just becalmed. I went swimming out there in probably 6,000 feet of water. I don't know how deep it was. It was super deep. And one day that we were just sitting out there drifting and there was no wind. And since we only had about 30 gallons of fuel, it wasn't like we could just waste our fuel because we needed that to charge our batteries. And we did have some solar, but it was pretty rudimentary in those days. This was the 2000, about, yeah, it was about 2000. We had a due east. And that's the way the winds were taken. We just couldn't fight this southeast wind. I was without a lot of sleep. I mean, I was getting two or three hours of cat naps, and that was it as we were going. We got out there about 600 miles offshore, and there was a storm, and I could see the storm. It was like 20 miles away, and I was trying to get around the storm, and so we went ahead and used our motor. And so we had full sails up, the motor was going, and we were doing hull speed, which was about seven and a half knots. We were, we were doing eight sometimes. The waves were really big at this time. We had 20 foot swells. I had 13 foot waves on top of the 20 foot swells. And the boat was handling it just fine. Uh, we'd get down in the trough and the swells and the waves were taller than our spreaders. We had a short mast on that boat. She didn't really like to get going until you had 15 knots of wind. That was about what it took. And I think we were doing between 15 to 18 knots of wind at the time. And we were doing hull speed. And we had a nice strong wind. And I was trying to get around this storm. And I really wanted to get around it to the south. And all of a sudden, in the midst of the, the waves and the swells, you get on top and you felt like you're on top of the world. And then you get in the swell and the waves were just surrounding you. You couldn't see anything but the sky. And then you were back on top again. Well, the boat would go down the swell at eight and a half knots, right? She'd scream down the swells, get into the bottom of the swell, the wind would stop. And then she'd slowly start going up the other side and the boat would shudder a little bit. And then we'd get just high enough up the swell that it would catch the wind. And the sails would go boom. You know, and the boat would lurch forward, we'd get tons of wind, and we'd go over the top of the swell and the wave, and the bow would come out of the water, and then she'd fall back. And when it hit the water, the whole boat would shake. 
and we go down the swell and then we do it again and this happened every you know every minute i suppose the boat was doing fine and we had gotten used to this and it was okay the boat was handling it we were handling it but you know we got used to it and then all of a sudden hannah was down below and i was on the wheel and the wind shifted and it shifted dramatically i didn't have time to loose the sheets i didn't even really know that i should and but i didn't have time to the wind clocked around 120 degrees and it backwinded the jenny we had 130 jenny and it just slammed it against the rigging and the other sail and we were close hauled at the time and so the when the wind shifted it it hit the boat really hard and it was very sudden it was very violent and the, the once the wind hit us it just slammed the down it slammed the boat down into the water we took 60 knots square off the beam on the port beam I was thrown out of the cockpit. We did have the jack lines and lifelines. So I hit the water and I was just a few feet from the rail. The sails were under the water. The boat was on her side. If the boat's going this way and here are the sails, when you slam down into the water this way, the boat stops and it turns sideways. The boat stops. I mean, it stops fast and then it spins around because the sails are acting like a huge break underwater. I'm out there in the water, 13 foot waves, 20 foot swells, and the boat's on her side. And there's a sound like a shotgun that goes off. And I'm in the water, just that fast. So I crawl back into the boat. She doesn't want to come back up again. And the um, we when we hit the water, one of the portholes on the starboard side busted. We had a hole about this big for the porthole. And the water was just gushing through this, filling the boat with water. I didn't know this at the time because I was up on the wheel. I crawl back into the into the boat. She slowly starts coming back up again. And as she comes back up, gallons and gallons of water just dumping on the deck, right? And waves are now crashing over the boat, 60 mile an hour winds. And the sails are really, really flying funny. I can't tell what's going on for sure, but I know I gotta take the sails down. So I immediately, got to the halyards and I I dropped the halyards and when I did that the entire Jenny went into the water that gunshot that we heard was the four stay breaking and so there went all my roller furling and all the aluminum and it just went off into the ocean there it was and there's the sail sitting in the water now and the mainsails flapping so I go up on the foredeck and I drop the mainsail and the boat is rocking violently and I, I managed to get the Jenny pulled back onto the boat and I tied it to the lifelines. There's sails all over the deck. The mainsail is just lying on the side of the deck all in a lump and the boat is rocking pretty violently and we're wallowing in the waves. About that time, Hannah comes up and she comes through the, through the hatch and said, what's going on? She was on the aft uh, cabin at the time and just slid and rolled onto the side of the boat you know and she comes up wants to know what's going on and, and uh, of course you know um, then we discuss the fact that you know the boat's full of water and we start trying to figure out what to do and, and what happened so hannah gets on the wheel the engine's still running uh, thank heavens and i'm hollering at her to keep it into the wind and the waves so that we stop wallowing the only way because everything's broken you know i figure i've got to climb the mast because i have to get the forestay somehow tied up we had stay locks and i had some spare cable i had cable cutters but i couldn't get to it i mean there was the whole you know the forestay was just laying on the deck at this point and the cable was just cut like it had been cut with a knife and it looked like it was the full length that i had hoped there was a little bit of cable up at the top still that i could hook the stay locks to so I'm telling Hannah to keep the boat into the wind and I start climbing the mast. And the boat is rocking back and forth violently. It's probably 45 degrees each direction. 45 degrees to the starboard, 45 degrees to the port side. And it's doing this rapidly. It's, this isn't a slow roll, this is rocking. And I have to climb the mast in this. And we had steps on the mast 
but Hannah couldn't pull me up the mast and I had my my lifeline or my jack lines on and so what I would do is I'd go a few steps up the mast I'd unclip and I'd clip to the next step go a few steps up unclip clip to the next step but as the boat was rocking back and forth 45 degrees at a time I had to when it reversed right so I could climb 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 the mast and then when when it reversed and staying back I had to grab the mast and swing me around and then I'd go up again. I'd start climbing until it rocked to the other side. I'd grab the mast and it'd swing me around. When we got up about the about the level of the spreaders, maybe a little bit above, I could reach my hand out and I could touch the swell in the water. We were that close to the swell. scary. And, of course, the head stays broke, so I'm afraid we're going to lose the mast. But she's a stout little boat. It was a keel-stepped mast. with a, And I get to the top, and sure enough, I can see where it's broke. And it's broke right at the swage. So the swage, I don't know, I was, I was told later that the swage was too tight and it actually crushed the cable. Um, but it was cut like it was cut with a knife. And so I had nothing to hook the stay lock to. So I took a spare halyard and I tied it up and then I brought it back down to the deck. I managed to get back down. And then I realized that I had done it the wrong way. So I tied off an end to the chain winch and then I went back up the mast a second time same process swinging back and forth this way then that way and I suppose that it was swinging back and forth about every 15 seconds right it was rocking violently and the clouds have come over by this time and the rain is going and you know thunder and lightning and I go back up there like I said with the halyard and I, I wrap it through the, um, through the top of the mast, and then I come climbing back down. This is the second time now. And I go to the, to the chain winch, and I tie it off, and then I've got coming from the bow, going up, looping through, and coming back to the winch, right? So then I could take the chain winch. We had a manual chain winch. It was not electric. And I tightened down the forestay. We hoisted a storm sail, hanked on, to the rope and of course it chafed the rope something fierce over the next few days and we had to do it again because the rope tore through and so there was another time a couple days later I had to climb the mast again luckily this time not in 60 mile an hour winds tie it off again luckily we had enough rope so this is one of the pet peeves I have even now to this day is we have a lot of rope in these lockers back here you can never have too much rope I carry Dyneema with me now so that if I lose some of the standing rigging I can I can put it up with something stronger than just plain old stay set rope line. We sailed 10 more days at about two knots, three knots, all the way to Puerto Rico like this. Wow. So we were at sea 14 days. Now here's where it gets a little bad. When we were in San Salvador we asked which water was drinking water, which was the potable water. And the marina there told us that the water we were putting in our tanks was the potable water. And we had two tanks. We would always fill one and then the other. One of our tanks was about half full. Um, we only had just a little bit of water. Like I said, we didn't have that much water. And so we had one full tank and one half full tank. Well, the full tank turned out not to be potable. So we only had about 10 gallons of water for 14 days with three babies and Hannah and I. And by the time we got knocked down, we were four or five days into it. So we had to go another 10, 10 days at that point with very, very little water all the way to Puerto Rico. And I just didn't feel like we could sail full speed with the head stay broke. And it's good that we didn't. So. We limped into Puerto Rico 10 days later, bedraggled and tired, and I'd been at the wheel for 10 days with an hour or two of sleep a night. It was to the point where we were hallucinating. It was like waking dreams, right? So you're right in the middle, you think you're wide awake, and all kinds of weird things start happening. You know, you, you hallucinate, you see everything. You know, I had, I had dreams of the boat sinking. Hannah had, you know, dreams of um, children with seaweed in their hair calling her from under the water. It was very scary. 
but that was uh, that was our first our first experience with really being offshore and I mean long way offshore we'd been up and down the coast you know but we were never more than you know 10 or 20 miles offshore before that we'd never been 600 miles offshore we turned south and we headed for Puerto Rico it's all we could do uh, we didn't have a, a life raft we did have a single side band radio but I didn't know how to use it very well we were outside the shipping lanes there was nobody to help there was nobody to, to call to and uh, there was just us so you had to make it work it um, it was a very very different experience and this was our introduction to to deep water blue water sailing I guess that's learning the hard way reef often reef early I've said that in some of my other videos and I know that that's a meme I know it's a cliche I know a lot of people say it but I'm telling you if we had reefed we would have been fine we wouldn't have been knocked down wouldn't have broken anything wouldn't everything have broken would have anything worked. everything would have just would have gone worked. a knot slower have, correct we wouldn't have overstressed the boat and um, you cannot outrun a storm at eight miles an hour you, you just can't don't try it this is where a lot of our a lot of our attitudes towards sailing was that experience and we do things a lot differently now than we did before because of that experience and in retrospect if we had reefed it would have been fine if I had realized what was coming I would have never been trying to run full sails at 15 to 18 knots of wind uh, I wouldn't have had full sails up with a storm on the horizon and this would have never happened but we were inexperienced a lot of times we learn by surviving and then we don't do that again just a note for all of y'all the ocean is very very unforgiving Poseidon is not to be messed with you're a little tiny boat on a very very big ocean that's the story as to why when we left coming to the Dominican Republic we weren't interested in going way out to sea. Both um, the World Cruising Routes book and you know even even the Thornless Path uh, by Van Zandt, this, this method is far better to take your time and take it easy and if the winds aren't going the way you want to go don't go that way. Just wait. If we had waited in San Salvador for long enough for a week. You would have found your opening just fine. Correct. We'd have found an opening and we'd have, you know, gotten a good weather window and we'd have been able to head southeast if we'd have waited for the weather to change. But we didn't have good weather. There was, I mean, we could, we could get a little bit from NOAA over the single side bed radio. We didn't have a weather fax. So a lot of our attitudes at that time were, you go sailing and you deal with what it is you go with where the winds take you. Well, there's a degree of combination of the two because you can't always rely on forecasts as we determined when we were heading down here. They got more and more inaccurate the further south we went. Well, there's, you're correct. And, and so at a certain point, you just have to say, wind is good now, we go now. Right. And deal with what happens. We can only plan for what's happening at the moment. If I had been aware the time that this was coming I would have reduced sail I would have been able to loose the sheets you know um, but I wasn't ready for that thank God we didn't have a crash jibe or anything like that because we were close hauled so we didn't lose the boom but we did lose the head stay it was it was quite the experience so that's a little bit of our story hey folks like subscribe tell your friends it really does help and it helps the channel grow, it helps us get higher in the search engines and if you do feel like you can, please donate and help us out on the journey and help us uh, restore this boat. We have a Patreon link, we also have a PayPal link um, on our website. 45 degrees starboard, 45 I guess you'll edit that.